Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches Poetry. This video is going to take you through five key quotations from UA Fanthorpe's first flight. We'll take a little look at language, structure, form, and of course their impact. Without any further ado, let's get started. Okay, so let's start with the um, opening line of the poem. Plane moves, I don't like the feel of it. In a car, I'd suspect low tire pressure. So first thing to draw your attention to is this elliptical phrasing. Notice that we're missing the article. There's no the, the plane moves. Uh, so it's sort of shortened. That's what it means by elliptical phrasing. And then we've got a caesura. OK, so that's our little bit of punctuation in the middle of the line. Um, and really, this is about creating a, a kind of jilted, jarring start. It's like when you're on a plane and you get that first little bit of movement and it, it, it unsettles you, which is why you then have this follow up of, you know, I don't like the feel of it. So there's something disconcerting and that is echoed through the fact that the line is broken up uh, in this way. And then um, the narrator or the poet, Fanthorpe, uh, creates an allusion to the familiar. And that's a lot of what she's doing at the beginning of the poem is kind of setting up the familiarity of dear familiar England. Um, and so in this case, she tries to compare this feeling with with something very kind of normal, which is, you know, low tire pressure. So it's kind of relating the narrator to the kind of comfort and familiarity of being on solid ground. OK, now I've introduced, sorry, I know it's quite a long quote, but it's the only way to do it, it to show you the interruption. So I'm sorry that my quotes are a little longer. I should really call them five key sections. OK, so we have a sudden swiftness Earth slithers off at an angle. So lovely sibilant, perhaps being quite mimetic of, again, the sort of movement of the plane, the kind of re repetition, but also the kind of gliding nature of it. We've got quite a zoomorphic metaphor of Earth slithering off at an angle don't get excited about snakes do you know what I mean don't don't go down the ooh delusions of biblical like evil nah, it's not Adam and Eve if anything it's just about the, the the kind of suddenness and the kind of angle that the earth sort of disappears off at it it almost minimizes the significance of the earth the fact that it slithers off at an angle um, and then we've got this juxtaposition between her feelings of discomfort and then the experienced. So the experienced solidly read guardians. So um, it's interesting that we've got this adverb of manner here as well, solidly, again, suggesting how comfortable they feel. But this is interrupted with a line from the second narrative voice, the secondary narrative. This is rather a short hop for me. And note how we've got quite a dismissive tone. Uh, by referring to this journey as a short hop. So what is a profound and frightening experience, experience for um, the first narrator is minimised here in the second. You could almost imagine this first bit of narration being like the thought process. And as the narrator is thinking, she's hearing this, oh, this is rather a short hop for me. That's why it's it's interrupting. It's even interrupting the enjambement. Um, that we have here. So if you read this bit, the experience solidly read guardians, discuss secretaries, business lunches. Um, and so, you know, we've got this little triad here that tells us something about who these experienced are. They are most likely businessmen, which is why I, I just naturally fall into the habit of saying he for the second narrative voice and she for the first. I may be wrong, but bearing in mind the time period, I think we can probably suggest uh, that it's 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 businessmen. OK. Oh, and sorry, there's the enjambement again that the solidly read guardians, discuss secretaries, business lunches again falls onto the next line. Now, as the poem continues and the, the, the narrator starts, the first narrator starts to feel a little bit more comfortable, you notice a, a shift in the way that the language is used. It becomes incredibly descriptive and very beautiful. So we've got this wonderful metaphor under us, 
the broad meringue kingdom of cumulus. So I'm just cutting that one out for just a split second. So the broad meringue kingdom. So think about what meringue looks like. It's all poofy and white, yeah? So just like the clouds. Um, but the, the use of the noun kingdom in this metaphor could relate to the idea of like heaven above the clouds, or it could just be demonstrating how majestic and vast it is. But what's interesting is that this broad meringue kingdom is under us. So we've got this lovely little preposition here that shows that the, the plane is above. It's, you know, so you could look at that symbolically as uh, in terms of status and position of power. And obviously cumulus is a type of, of cloud. So that's just going back to the broad meringue. And again, notice you've got another interruption and it's a declarative. And a lot of this, a lot of what the second narrator uses is declarative and imperative. It sort of shows his authority. The next lot of water will be the med. He's demonstrating himself as, a, as an expert in what to expect now. He knows what C is coming up next. And again, it interrupts this very, very profound found bit of thought about what's going on in the world outside the aeroplane and that imagery again another metaphor here about the crinkled tangerine stain that light spreads on an evening sea at home so we're getting the image of that kind of late light the the sort of orangey sunset and the way that that kind of echoes on the water so really quite beautiful imagery to do with the sea and the sun and the clouds interrupted with this no at all okay now as we get towards the uh, latter part of the poem this is where it gets really profound and we start seeing that you know classic fanthorpe making a comment uh, on the kind of um, social and cultural kind of shifts and changes so we have come too high for history so the first thing we need to look at is we've moved into first person plural pronouns i.e it's inclusive she's no longer talking about herself and her own experience now it's everyone and she does it twice where we are now deals only with tomorrow and um, so this metaphor about having come too high for history is really interesting it might be to do with the idea of time zones which is followed up in this next couple of lines but also it might be to do something to do with learning lessons like almost like we're progressing to quickly um, so we're almost moving too fast into the future so we've lost that sense of history um, and then we have where we are now deals only with tomorrow confounds the forecasters to Smith's clocks we've got this lovely personification of the aeroplane or the situation confounding so that's confusing and dismissing clocks so we've definitely moved into an idea about time zones here the, the the point being is that now that they're flying they're flying so high they're kind of breaking the rules um, that we live by forecasts times clocks history the future uh, it's a comment on this kind of shifting power again and this is summed up so wonderfully in this quite complicated image towards the end we've got our last bit of interruption from our know-it-all narrator uh, so note the arrogance of his tone coming through that elliptical phrasing my last trip was Beijing know where that is so elliptical as in it should be do you know where that is um, but it's quite a kind of demanding way of speaking here Beijing Peking you'd say uh, this is because um, Peking changed then became Beijing but he is assuming that the person he's talking to would be ignorant as to the the change in name so again positioning himself as a person of authority and then we move into these sort of imperative statements you know Peking is wrong if you'd been there you call it Beijing like me go on say it uh, so again this idea about control and power but remember what I said before or in the previous video about how the conversation of the second narrative starts to become quite mundane. So he's saying, I know everything, but actually what he's saying is trivial and pointless. Whereas the inexperienced flyer is tackling the big ideas. And look at this. So this massive juxtaposition between the mundane and the trivial and the profound. Mackerel wigs dispense the justice of air. Oh, one of my favourite lines. Right, what on earth is a mackerel wig, I hear you say? Okay, 
clearly metaphor. We've got two potential interpretations here. Okay, it could be a metaphor for the clouds. So think about wigs that judges would wear. So they're like, and white, looks like clouds. And a mackerel sky, uh, Google it, Google mackerel sky and look at images. And you'll see that it's a kind of cloud formation, which is, you know, just like um, a judge's wig. So in that case, what this means is, clouds i.e nature dispense the justice of air so another metaphor here so if you're going to dispense the justice of air it's like a judgment so one interpretation is nature the clouds decide whether we stay up or not yeah so nature is most powerful but we cannot forget that mackerel as a choice of metaphor of course makes you think of the fish the fish which are long and sleek and silvery and incredibly fast look a little bit like aeroplanes so the secondary interpretation and I want you to talk about both I want you to show both because that's the crux of the poem is that it's either or so the secondary interpretation is the aeroplane dispenses the justice of air and the aeroplane, by that we mean man. Man dispenses the justice of air. So that line means simultaneously, either nature controls what we do and whether we live or die, or man controls what we do, whether we live or die. It's mind-blowingly clever and brilliant and beautiful. And then we get more of a sense of what Fanthorpe's narrators thought is in that in this height nothing lives yeah so it's not possible to live up here again they're you know they're obviously protected by the the metal tin that is the mackerel the the aeroplane but note the declarative nature of this it's fact nothing lives here it's too cold lovely little minor sentence too near the sun now this is an allusion, yeah, a reference, allusion to Icarus, um, who flew too close to the sun and the, his wings that had been made melted and then he fell to his death. So actually the end of this poem is a warning about what happens when you start playing God, when you start moving too fast, forgetting about history. This is Fanthorpe saying, okay, well, this is all very exciting. But we've manage to fly but is this a step too far are we becoming too arrogant are we in danger of damaging ourselves what a brilliant poem oh i love this poem so much uh, and it's made so much more powerful because of the contrast between this profound spectacular thinking and this nonsense uh trivialities from the secondary narrator Sorry, that went on a little longer than I was meant to, but when I get going on this poem, I cannot stop. Thank you very, very, very much for watching. Give me a shout if you've got any questions or you want me to go over anything, or if you want to kind of challenge anything I've said or given an, another interpretation, I'd love to hear your ideas. If you haven't subscribed, click that button. If you have, thank you very much. Right, thank you so much again. Happy revising. <laughs>